Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our second and last panel uh, for today. This panel will uh, deal with new models to motivating a sales team, uh, subject I'm sure concerns pretty much everybody who is uh, in this business. Um, and we will tackle that uh, subject from the highest executive level to hear uh, what they have to say and how they're dealing with this uh, subject. So before uh, giving the, our, our distinguished panelists the opportunity to present themselves, I would just like to lay out the premise of this uh, discussion. It's a common belief that um, in general and in sales for the financial sector in particular, reward and um, motivation and responsibility are things that go together in a way that the higher the reward, the one can only assume the higher the responsibility will be uh, that the worker will display, uh, will demonstrate. The question is what do you do when the entire rewarding model in one industry, particularly the FX industry, changes inherently? How do you uh, cope with that situation? This is something that we will be dealing with uh, during this panel, and now it would be the good opportunity to allow our panelists to present themselves. Go ahead, Lars. Uh, my name is Lars Holst. I'm CEO of uh, CFH Clearing in London. So we have two lines of business. We do prime to prime services, uh, and we do uh, technology development for the uh, institutional space. We, unlike uh, most of the panel, we only do B2B, uh, so no retail at all. <coughs> Mr. Renive, I'm the CEO of FACM, and uh, obviously primarily we're a retail uh, foreign exchange provider all over the world, and uh, we also have a, a B2B sales force as well, so we can talk about that too. Hi, my name is Jim Tatchell, I'm Director of Institutional Sales for London Capital Group. We have a couple of different strands to our business as well, so we have LCGFX, which is the institutional FX brokerage. But we also have a private client retail product called Capital Spreads, which is our own brand, predominantly UK based, that we're looking to expand more internationally through partnerships, white labels and such. Hello, uh, Mohamed Rasool, uh, CEO of uh, Gain Capital EMEA. Uh, we sell both uh, directly and indirectly uh, globally. Uh, we provide a lot of liquidity particularly specializing in uh, contracts for differences as well as uh, institutional access to uh, FX ECNs via our own uh, ECN GTX. Hello, my name is Ryan Nettles. I'm uh, with Swiss World Bank. I'm Director of Foreign Services. Uh, we are here in Cyprus uh, to promote our institutional services uh, to the B2B uh, network. Here. Hello, hi, my name is Luis Sanchez. First of all, I would like to say thank you for organizers for inviting me to this panel. I hope you enjoy. I'm the first vice president at Lucas Coffee Bank. I would like to start off by saying uh, what you mentioned, Lars. Um, if any of you, of course, as you can see, we've tried to mix uh, the list of panelists. Of course, not everybody has the same exact line of business, otherwise this would have been a tad redundant. So you can feel free if I'm asking question which is not directly uh, concerning your business, you can feel free to take it uh, more closely to what uh, you do. I think that in its core, as I mentioned in the beginning, motivating a sales team is something that every line of business needs. I mean, it's, uh, be it in the financial industry or even in the food industry. So I'm sure we can all find uh, common grounds. But having said that, let's go directly to the uh, strongest uh, retail perspective of uh, this question. In the past few years, retail FX brokers moved away from the dealing desk model and went into the STP, the short, uh, straight through proce um, processing STP model. If you can please tell the audience about what you perceive as the reasons for this move and how that affected sales teams in your company. Uh, in the industry in general and in your company in particular. I would like to start with you, Drew. I think uh, we made that change uh, in late 2006 and um, finished it around 2007. I think that what it enabled us to do is the biggest thing, you know, benefit is that before you even get to the marketing pitch of what do the clients are, which is obviously everybody knows what that is, is the marketing pitch to the sales force 
is that now you can talk to your clients, sell the clients, talk to them about whatever strategy, whatever works best for them, as predatory as it can be, you know, to the dealers because there's no more dealers. No one is going to come from some other room and yell at you to say, what the fuck is this client and why is he running us over and losing us money? And that, what really hurts a lot of FX firms like Salesforce is, is at the end of the day, in a dealing desk firm, the dealers make all the decisions, the dealers control you know, all the, if you will, the power in the company and you can work two months on a great client and if he runs over the desk in his first 10 trades, he gets turned off, right? And people, for salespeople, that's extremely demotivating. It's also, people get, just a human being, gets extremely demotivated and feels a little disingenuous that he is telling clients, you know, that to do this or to do that and knowing that the firm is betting against the client. So I think that Moving to an STP model allows you to get a better caliber of sales force, allows you to motivate them you know, in a much cleaner way, and it's a, generally been the bedrock of uh, you know, being a much better sales force. You know, much, um, so it's so much more motivated, you know, as they don't doubt the, if you will, the incentive of their employer. We'll get into the specifics of that a bit later. Mohammed, how did you experience that in a Gink. I think it's a bit ironic I'm the, the next one, right? <laughs> um, I, I, don't think, um, I don't think from our perspective, we run both models um, inside the organization. I think we're more concerned about um, you know, giving the best experience to the customer. Um, at some point in time, even in an agency model, someone's getting run over. And um, this industry is about relationships, whether it's B2B or B2C. So I think you know, for us, we don't uh, we take a very you know simplistic view of uh, of, of how we're gonna you know talk to the customer and be honest with them up front. Namely, and, namely, uh, ask them the tough questions. Am I gonna have to worry about um, you know predatory order flow coming from you? Um, if so, okay, this is probably a better option. If it's a retail uh, speculator who's really just looking to make sure they get the best possible price and uh, the most cost-effective price for them, and the order flow is very benign, then there's a better option than uh, than an STP option. So um, that's but that's how we approach it. I mean, and, and the sales teams know that, and they know that we can deal with uh, any type of business uh, that they bring in because um, we have different options. I think that's how we've evolved. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach in our market anymore. So you see it as advantage of keeping these two types of uh, For sure. Of I think, you know, even if, even if you ask Drew, I mean, Drew's made the same decision. So you need to have everything. Jim, would you like to? Yeah, I mean, we have a, a similar blended approach, actually. So what we've seen over the past few years is instead of all clients being chucked into one bucket and you hope everyone loses, which was the old way of doing things, actually clients have become more sophisticated they're using much better, more developed trading platforms, and we're seeing the clients evolve, and, and that's a good thing because then you can, uh, you can analyze the client base a lot more accurately, you can put them in the right bracket, as we was, Mohammed was just mentioning, and then you can provide the best experience. So your clients then become more comfortable with the experience they're having with you, and your client longevity is therefore much greater. And I'd much rather have a client who sticks with me for years and years rather than one that burns out in the, you know, the matter of some companies' hours, but most companies now, uh, months. I'd rather, rather they came and they stuck around because then you have a good relationship and everything works much smoother. And they can feed back to you if there's something you're not doing right, then they can tell you. It's, it's just common sense. Ryan, how do you experience that in Swiss Group Bank? Jim about the, uh, we, have, we offer a blended approach as well. Uh, we're very active in uh, electronic market making as well as run an agency business as well. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we still apply the best execution practices, whether it's uh, the, the deal comes to our book or it goes out. Uh, it's all, and nowadays with the, uh, a lot of price uh, providers out there, so clients can easily reference us versus other providers to see if it's a fair execution. But uh, actually, uh, you know, instead of uh, sending the flow out to the market, uh, there's latency involved with that. You'll get a faster execution 
uh, when we confirm the price directly instead of sending it out. Uh, so it, it's all about the best execution uh, we can provide to our clients. And, and so far, I, I feel that SwissBlade has achieved this uh, with our clients. So we have, we have a very happy client base uh, based on our execution. We feel, and we strive to make sure we have this always. Is a, the execution is key to being successful in this business. Two quarters ago, we've conducted a research in uh, Forex Magnet. We've published it in our uh, quarterly industry report, um, according to which the move that we've just uh, discussed moved from a dealing desk model more to the STP model has resulted in a reduction in spreads instead of almost uh, obsolete MD4 based classic accounts, which allow brokers with dealing desk to fix the spread at uh, three pips uh, normally and operate their own in-house risk model and remunerate sales staff on the net deposit basis. Now, basically, the question is whether this uh, influenced directly your business and how. Who would like to venture the answer to that? Can you clarify the question? Yes, I mean, we have done, we have experienced uh, uh, moving from the dealing desk model into the SDP model. According to our research, it reduced the spreads according to which the sales team receive their bonuses. Is that correct? I think it depends on what market you're talking about. I mean, the re you, sheer retail. Yeah, but like retail in, um, in the US is different than the UK is different than, EMEA, you know, different parts of EMEA is different than Asia PAC. I would imagine in, in emerging markets, you're right. Mm -hmm. you know, because I think in a lot of the emerging markets, whether the Middle East or parts of Asia or, or Latin or South America, the spread with there compared to more mature markets is, is was probably ridiculous, you know, comparatively. Um, if you're looking at mature markets, um, places like the US, UK, continental Europe, I don't think um, it's had much of an impact at all on spread width. Um, and, you know, in, in, but in emerging markets, for sure. Yeah. So if we go to a more general direction and talk about um, motivating your sales team in each of your uh, specific companies, Louis, for example, what can you tell us about the strategies that are held in Dukas Coffee Bank? Well, I mean, when it comes to motivating the sales and try to find the right equation is one of the questions that everybody asks. How can we keep ourselves motivated? How can we keep ourselves happy? And at the same time, have a financial income to the company. So we, in, in Dukas Coffee, have two different approaches. One is a financial motivation, and the other one is a non-financial motivation. So what we try to do is keep our sales team motivated, keep them a good spirit, have a good quality of sales. So we, in what we do is we have a fixed income of 80% and a valuable income of 20%. So that makes a good team spirit. So we try to keep ourselves with us in a long term. For example, at Douglas Copy, each sales stays more like between four to five years. Because somebody has a question and says, how much does it cost to lose a employee, how much does it cost to retrain a new employee? So we balance this equation by having this formula. And from the non-financial motivation, what we do is we try to speak with our people. What is your problem? I mean, open door politics. You have anything <laughs> non-related to the business, you have any situation, come and talk to us. We are here to help you. This is like a family. I mean, your employees need to understand that we are not only bosses and we are not only here to make income that we are human beings and they have to be part of something and at the same time what we do is we assign each one of the sales in the retail side especially a little project a project that consumes between 10 to 15 percent of the time so this little project they will develop it alone or among the other departments so this person is going to speak with the marketing department is going to speak with the IT department with the development departments so he feels he's part of something. Can you give an example for such a project? Yes, for example, we did make a, what is called wind trip. And in this wind trip, we assign a, a person that has to do a campaign that you play a game and you win a trip. And this trip was to Geneva. So he had to design the whole marketing web page about the trip, talk to the marketing department, send the emails to the database that we have, especially for the, the dead leads. At the same hand, time has to integrate it with the IT department, so this is game is technology-wise done. So, and at the same time, has to go with the legal department to make sure that all the disclaimers are over there. 
So this little, like we call it, I give you a baby, raise it, take care of it, and maybe it comes a big project. So if it comes a big project, you will be the responsible person. So instead of this guy just calling all day and saying, okay, I'm a what, sales, call center, whatever, I've been assigned something special. And this something special motivates me to succeed, motivates me in a, in a different environment. That's, that's how we do it. Lars, can you tell us a little bit about uh, I think that you'll find huge cultural differences in, in what actually motivates people. Uh, you know, of course, we all operate, I guess, with soft and, and hard targets. But ultimately, uh, I don't think a good sales guy is not driven by money. Not what? Not driven by money. That, that would at least be a, a first to me. Uh, so, of course. What you know, else then? Yeah, in, empowerment, you know, involvement. We, in, in our development projects, as an example, we, we always have someone from the sales side that is a, what, what do we call it, a business sponsor. So they oversee the, the, the process in, in conjunction, of course, with the project managers. But I think it, what has changed you know, since, I, since I started many, many years ago, back then, you know, it was very comms driven, uh, pure comms actually. Uh, and people, they grow older. We want institutional salespeople, they want more safety. Uh, so the bases have gone up. I think base remuneration has gone up. But still, uh, I've the, the, the variable component where we kind of tie uh, uh, more or less linearly the, the uh, company performance uh, to, to the individual performance, uh, that, that still needs to exist in, in my opinion. Uh, so of course, a sales guy needs to be motivated, he needs to be driven uh, by money. Uh, I don't want to you know, create a big argument, but I, I still think that, that greed is good uh, to an extent. Uh, because you know how you you don't want people that come nine to five, uh, you know I'm I'm from Denmark, you know we're most safest work environment in the world, and you know it's difficult to get people to work outside nine to five, uh, and and now again I don't want to raise a lot of argument, but you know in 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 the Western world we of course have the problem that raise you know, raise an, an argument it's okay. okay but, I guess we all we all know what I'm talking about. That that you know, uh, this is the relationship. Uh, one of my colleagues here said it is very much relationship driven game, uh, in particular in, in the B two B space. And uh, I think we're all willing to pay premium uh, for the right people, because uh, you know the right people, they might necessarily be able to to transfer business here and now, but they have a track record of being able to to raise and generate business. And and uh, in in our industry, uh, there's not a lot of them. Uh, you know most. Again, most salespeople, you know, yes, they, they hum along, uh, they come to the office, they, they uh, you know, do their calls and, and to, uh, you know, make the stats, the call reports and all of that. But I guess in, in all our companies, it's 20% it's of the salespeople, they generate 80% of the business. And uh, hey, you know, I'm, I'm willing to pay these 20%, uh, you know, two or three times as much as, as uh, the low performers. Uh, I think it's common sense. Jim but has something to say. That's absolutely that. right. I mean, I, I don't think that just being warm and cuddly and friendly and being a big family is the answer. I think that it's very clear that the top performing salesmen are the guys that need to make the most money because otherwise it's crazy. Because otherwise, your top performing guy would be grumpy because he's subsidizing a load of people that aren't pulling their weight. And although I understand Luis's his, his, um, his motivation behind that, I can't have that where, where the best guys are being paid less because someone else happens to be there. That makes no sense to me. What's important to us at LCG is that, um, that the salespeople are rewarded in line with the amount of revenue that they produce. And that might be nowadays, because we were talking earlier about STP, that the client commission that is charged on trading is a very direct relationship to the amount they trade. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. And that's the way that, that I can, the only way I can see it going. You, you can't take money away from the top performers and give it to the other guys just because you're a friendly family. I think that, you know, on the institutional sales, we are very, you know, compensation focused. I think, you know, what Lars was saying is, you know, I second it too. I think it's a, it's a question of, 
there is very few guys who are very good and have most of their relationships. You have to pay a premium for their relationship. I think it's definitely, that's the institutional business. Um, I think the retail business is 100% different. So retail business, to get direct to your, to your question, we never pay ever. We never paid on volume, right? Uh, we don't do, um, we don't believe, we think the retail business, the first line of compliance need to be how you compensate salespeople. And if you compensate salespeople to churn customers, they will churn customers. So and there's no we compliance, had and there's no compliance uh, program in the world that gets over you know, the incentive, right? If the incentive is to churn customers, they will churn customers. Now an institutional client, he watches out for himself, he can't be churned by a salesperson. Not true for the thing. So we don't do a few things. We don't have, uh, in retail, uh, we don't assign a person to a client. Right? It's, a, it's a call center, you know, nothing. We do lots of training. Uh, we don't take, you know, most of our, our retail sales guys are out of college and we train from scratch. Uh, we don't pay commissions to, to retail sales people. Uh, and yes, we lose people to the, because of that, but it's a much easier, cleaner, you know, and we operate under enormous amount of regulatory scrutiny, and that's, I found that out to be, you know, a lot cleaner. And, uh, you know, what we do with, uh, you know, we just tier the sales forces in terms of reward the guys who are the best and then send them to more institutional, you know, where they can make, you know, a lot of money. And I think that that's sort of our, uh, that's, like the, that's, how, that's how we tier and that's how we get the best performers in retail sort of compensated well, but in the retail pool, you introduce commissions, you introduce trouble. That's been my motto, and I, you know, to be honest, I think everybody will 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 know that that you know, even in the institutional business, you we, we compensate on commissions. It creates enormous drama, right? It's you know, my client did this, and my client went before that client, and or my client went after that client, and isn't in line, and it's that, the, re the B2B businesses are smaller, smaller sales forces, less clients, that drama can be contained. If that drama, you know, entered the, you know, a retail sales force, we have 900 people working at FXCM, um, that would be just, you know, insane. And so we could, couldn't function as an organization, uh, you know, not with the kind of culture we want. We had earlier a keynote speech in which uh, the audience received the opportunity to ask questions, and um, one of uh, one gentleman stood up and introduced himself as a trader, and he asked the person who gave the keynote speech, he asked him, um, "What can you do in order to cope with the fact that uh, forex industry has such a bad reputation of people profiting from their clients' losses?" Specifically, that uh, keynote speaker did not want to answer that question, but that question is not a conspiracy theory in the sense that, in many, many cases, and for a pretty long period of time, salespeople, for example, were rewarded on the client's losses. Now, the question is how is that issue being uh, dealt with nowadays, now that we are all smarter? Well, I can comment on that a bit. I mean, I've worked for um, two relatively large um, market makers, and um, in neither of those organizations did we compensate uh, the retail sales organization based off of client losses. Um, I think that's a that's a bad idea. You know, kind of to Drew's point, when you introduce that into the equation on the front lines, you're going to get a lot of nastiness that comes out the back end that you can't control. So your first line of defense has to be proper comp models, but to the last point, when you structure, you have different types of teams um, that are selling different types of business, particularly in, in, in bigger companies. And at some point in time, particularly on the, re on the institutional side, um, the concept of profitability has to come into play, uh, I believe, when you compensate your staff, right? Because all business is not good business for the firm, um, and uh, all volume is not good volume, and so this concept of the firm's profitability has to be introduced into the equation in order to properly compensate your, your top level salespeople on the institutional side. And in that calculation, there will always be market making revenue, which at some point in time has a correlation to client um, p and um, And so um, you, you can't avoid it. I think it's just a part of the industry. 
because at some point, if you go deep enough, it's going to be there. Um, but again, I think you have to look at it differently between institutional and retail. I think if you do that on the retail side, and the firms that do the, that do do that on the retail side, I think you need to think twice about you know the type of firm you're dealing with. I think on the institutional side, there isn't a mature firm out there that it's as black and white as you get paid on the inverse of customer losses. I just don't think that happens anymore. Profitability, yes. The inverse to customer losses, no. Ryan. Yeah, I think uh, uh, compensating sales on or on uh, customer losses is a huge conflict of interest and very unethical. Uh, these are not practices we do at SwissQuote. Um, but I do believe I, you know, I've been 15 years in, in uh, financial services. Started as a as a futures broker, and where I was compensated only on commission only. Uh, maybe some of you also started this way, but uh, uh, it, you know. And, and, I think sales, in the end, have to be financially rewarded for their success. Um, but you know, I moved from sales into management, uh, and things change, and you you see the opposite side. You see about running a business and, and things like that. So, can you need, elaborate a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, of course. So, um, uh, I and at Swissco, we've we've acquired a few companies in the last three years. One was uh, MIG Bank in, in uh, 2013, and AC, ACM in 2010. And both had very different uh, type of uh, ways of comp compensating their, their sales, um, and and I've seen uh, as managing sales teams with other companies, and uh, uh, there's lots of ways to motivate sales uh, uh, with a financial incentive. Um, but the what has worked best uh, and what we implemented at Swissquote is the the interests have to be in line with the sales, the company, and the client. Uh, we have standardized retail conditions on our website. Um, so uh, sales get a salary plus a bonus. Uh, their incentive is to acquire customers. Okay, so the more customers they acquire, uh, the better, and they earn on the bonus as a revenue share. Okay, uh, we've, we've had mo in, we've acquired companies, I won't mention one, uh, had a money in type of uh, compensation scheme based on the number of assets that came in. And stayed with the with the company. Uh, we, there's been also uh, ways of compensating sales on on volume, like a fixed per million type of volume. Um, the money in there's lots of conflicts of interest there. It's not in line with the company. It may be in line with the, the sales, but not necessarily not in, in line with the company or the client. Uh, also, a, a fixed commission uh, when you when you're experiencing times of low volatility. Um, you know, when you're paying a, a, a sales a, a fixed amount uh, bonus in uh, per million, uh, and you have increasing costs and low trading volume, but you're still paying the same amount, uh, this is also a, uh, not in line with the company's interest. So on a revenue share, using standardized uh, conditions for retail clients, uh, it gives the incentive of sales to be on the phones, acquire business, uh, even though they have no power to in, uh, increase, you know, make the customer trade, uh, they promote the other value-added products that we offer, uh, such as we have our research department that uh, that uh, offers uh, intraday reports, technical reports that, that they can utilize if the client is not trading. Hey, they'll suggest things like this, or we use also we have third-party partners that uh, provide uh, you know analysis and things like that. You know, you have the trading signals that are on MT4. Uh, these are all things that sales uh, uh, does to promote uh, trading with Swissquote and, and all the products and services that are available through us. Uh, and in the end, um, you know, the model we decided on, which was the, uh, you know, you have to have a fixed uh, salary, of course, but uh, but the incentive on revenue uh, has been the, so far the best uh, choice, and it has motivated, kept motivating the sales. So the more business they bring in, the uh, the more money they make, and we we tend to retain these high-producing uh, type of salespeople, which everyone is looking for. There's a, another way that you can motivate sales teams, and um, I'm thinking of personal experience. I worked for a company where the sales director sat at his desk for day after day with his head down, looking at people's calendars, and then giving the managers grief when people weren't having enough meetings, and that's pretty much all he did. And the sales team got more and more demotivated, and in the end, he left. 
and that's a really bad way of doing it. So you know, I've lived through that. It's far better to be engaged with your sales team, to encourage them, to help them, to support them, to occasionally give them a kick when they need a kick, but in a nice friendly way, of course, and to, to actually um, give them the benefit of your experience if you've been around the block a few times, like all of us, I think, have. Uh, there are other ways of doing it on top of money. I think, the although my base case is that the, the guys that perform best get the most money, of course they do, but also if they're working for a company that they feel comfortable with, that is going in the right direction, that is building up, that they're sort of proud of, then they will be motivated and they will stay for longer. Like Luis was saying, you know, four or five years is not a bad stretch for the company. I mean, I've lasted that long for one or two companies. But anyway, um, it's important to, to, um, to maintain that good relationship with your sales team and for them to trust the company that they work for. And you do that by, um, by retaining your clients as well. If your clients stick around for longer, which, um, which I'm happy to say ours do, then the sales team then feel happy going into work and, and they're all happy, smiley people sell. Is it possible to estimate the life expectancy of a sales team? Well, we, we don't no, kill them. You mean life expectancy <laughs> in the company? In one company. Well, if they don't perform, yeah, they've got to go. But um, no, to, to estimate the life expectancy is, is tough because, you know, again, you've got to draw a line between retail sales guys and institutional guys. And I very much like the, um, the strategy of the retail guys learning the ropes there and the ones that are shining then move up to institutional so they'll stick around for longer um, and sometimes you get salespeople who, who stick around for much much longer because they're still doing well and still performing what we don't want to see is people becoming a nine to five like Lars was saying is in, in the worst case where you just have people that are towing the line and, and going through the motions you've got to keep people on their toes I think moving them to different products is a, is a good way of doing it by um, looking at investment by moving forward as a company by looking at new markets I mean, we're, we're particularly looking at the international market because our sales teams are our partners in a way so if you're a, an institutional guy who works with us and you bring in a good partner and you're working well with them and they're bringing in lots of business you get paid a lot and everyone's happy so you, you need to um, you need to make people stick around by by supporting them that way Mohammed, what you wanted to add something? I was going to add that I think for the retail groups, when you when you set up a retail program, um, and this has to do with turnover as well, is if you have a good system, um, the most important thing for a retail salesperson is that they can control, you know, what happens, right? I mean that they they can come to work every day and realize that they can affect personally whether or not they get a nice bonus at the end of the month or not, right? Now. My current opinion is that, which is a bit different than yours, is that they cannot impact volume. That a cross sell is not, you know, you're not going to be able to have them, and they're going to figure that out relatively soon that they cannot materially impact volume. And that um, the way that we count the retail group is about goals and objectives, you know, that mesh with the company's interests, right? They don't go down to that level of volume or assets or anything like that, because I think the retail seller. Um, and you have to give them a career path for the future. I think that's important as well. But the retail seller needs to be able to control their destiny. And then what will happen is those that succeed will stick around. Those that don't will leave. That's where you get your turnover. Then you re repeat. And the system will basically you know, filter out the strong from the weak. And whatever, you know, you're going to get natural attrition there. But it has to be something they can control day in and day out. I think if not, people get frustrated and then they're leaving for the wrong reasons. Louis, is this uh, trend something you also experience? Yes, in first of all, I want to clarify uh, that I do believe, like all of you, that the best sales have to be well paid, of course. What I'm trying to say that it's not only financial, the motivation, there's other things behind that. That's just for clarification. Um, I agree as well with what uh, Drew said, that the retail people should not be paid in volume. And like uh, Ryan says, that we shouldn't share the losses. I mean, but what, what to do sometimes to, to, to motivate uh, retail sales guys? I mean, sometimes it's very important what is called, and I speak from my experience and my culture as well. I, I'm from Latin America, so we are driven more by heart, let's say. Recognition. Sometimes uh, recognition is much more valuable than the money I have. Sometimes I have a, I don't know, the best sales, I earn a lot of money, but I'm 
expecting for recognition, I'm expecting maybe for a promotion, which for us is when we have to make a decision, what is one of the most difficult decisions that we have is who to promote, when to promote. Maybe he's a good sales guy, but could he be able to manage a team? Are we choosing the right person? Is this gonna make jealousy to the other people? Why I'm not promoted? I'm here eight years and he's only three, but he has best results and me don't. So there are many factors uh, that, that involve, and I think one also important is this, uh, having the recognition. Sometimes, like in my country, a shake of the hand and a thank you work like a bonus. Of course, I'm expecting the bonus as well, but this, don't get me wrong, encourage me to go home and say, this is the reason why I'm working here. This is the reason why I feel proud of Dukas Kopi, and this is the reason why I'll not work from nine to five, but I work from nine and to whatever it takes, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., I'm always gonna be there because I belong to somewhere. I belong to a, a family, and this family is giving me my bonus, my financial things, but it's giving me my personal side, the recognition that I wanted to have. Lars, as the one who raised the issue of uh, cultural differences, what do you think about this? Uh, uh, no, of course I agree view. that it's not all about money uh, in, in the B2B space, but I, I guess uh, you know, it, it will be the main driver forever. But yeah, there are other dimensions to, uh, to compensation, and, and I think the key also here is retention, actually. Uh, we, we, at least in our company, have been uh, fortunate enough to, to retain people. I've have some salespeople that worked with me in three companies for more than 10 years. So, you know, treat them well, uh, listen to them. Uh, what, what can you do to, to make them happy besides money? Uh, we, we have a warrant program in our company as well. Uh, I guess it's also easier in, in a growth company like ours to, to make it fun, to make it interesting. We've gone from, you know, zero to, to 70 plus people in, in matter of five to six years. Uh, so you know, there's always new opportunities coming up, new markets opening, new uh, offices that we open. I guess it's more difficult in, in a mature company. Again, I'm not you know, saying that uh, we, we won't get there, but as long as it's, it's fun, that we can create an, an identity, because I think that's also key, uh, as Louisie says, that that the, the staff, they can relate to the company, that we have a common identity, uh, that you, you know, we have a common and shared goal and vision. Uh, I think that, that goes a long way also in, in aligning the interests. But again, I'm, I'm still fundamentally of the opinion that you know, company yield on the client should be rewarded. And uh, you know, we also do that, plus we, we reward on, on the basis of, of the company performance. So they will, uh, I think, forever be, be the, the main components. And then uh, we, we, of course, have to continue to add new dimensions for, for retention and, and uh, motivation. To add something? I think that, you know, I think to add to that is that we remind people 95% of management at FXCM started out at entry level, be it sales or some other entry level job. I think that essentially all the people who are now, you know, telling you what to do, you have to report to, that I know you on a daily basis, you know, why you should do better, you used to do your job. So they have empathy, right? Uh, we know what you're going through. At the same time, they, you know, uh, are going to be better for it. And the person can look up and say, if I work hard and I do really well, I can go to management too. And I think, I think the industry does this very well. It's not just us in a sense that firms do, do give a lot of people, because this was an industry that was shunned by a lot of uh, uh, people for a long time, we as an industry give opportunities to people other firms don't give opportunities to. And I think the international nature of the business, you know, helps that and in the, um, you know, the, if you will, sort of the, the partisan nature, and partisan is the wrong word, but essentially kind of the insurgent nature of the industry that is not a mainstream industry helps that too and I think that that's something that a person that in a normal sort of a bank or something like that would not get very far right could get you know as far as it could um, you know could get very far very up to the top 
you know, of, a, of an FX firm, and I think that's um, that's unique, and I think that's something that um, you know we're very proud of. And I know that this is from many FX firms I know. A lot of this is the same, and I think this is something that uh, the industry should lose sight of and shouldn't go back, shouldn't uh, move into this. A lot of industries have stratification by education and stratification by jobs where the people in the call center will never be anything but people in the call center. They'll turn them in, turn them out. And I think that's something that you get the best employees by also having them see kind of what the future you know can hold for can hold for them. And of course you're gonna get the churn from the people that say, I'm not gonna invest the time, you know, doing the grunt work in the beginning to maybe someday, you know, be a senior uh, person. I want to rewards today. The person who's 22 and won rewards today will never be a good person, right? Maybe, but not for us, you know, and not for an established company. Maybe he'll do it by himself, but will he be a good employee? No. And I think that's, uh, and that's part of not paying commissions now, essentially getting people used to not our reward system that is, you know, so instantaneous. And that's something that. I think helps a lot. You know, it, it builds a culture that's better, builds a sales force that's cleaner. Because the person who says, I want to be here for 10 years, is not going to go burn the clients, is not going to go burn the company, is going to feel a lot more responsible, is going to feel a lot more loyalty. And, you know, there's a lot of gray areas, right, of is this a good client? Is this uh, uh, something this, I should be pitching this client or something else? And people can use a lot of judgment, you know, if they feel responsible because they feel loyal. I better judgment than if they're seeking short-term rewards. Before we move to questions from the audience, uh, Ryan raised earlier uh, an issue, an interesting issue about um, what do you do if you acquire a company where the cultural, let's say, it creates a clash of cultures when it comes to uh, sales, um, sales culture. How does one cope with that? Who would like to talk I about that? I think we've bought into the same issues, ran into sales forces that were motivated in all sorts of extraordinarily bad ways. And from the managerial level, how do you cope with that? That you have to say it's gonna be our way and that's it. And I think there is no nice way to arrange that that flower bouquet. You know, like that's a you know you have to be nicer about the fact that this person that this sales force now faces a lot of fear and uncertainty acquired company but at the same time if you allow things that that's generally why that company underperformed and had to be sold to taint your organization the quicker you get through this transition the better and we believe in you know ripping the band-aid off quickly is better than uh, than letting it fester for a long time and you try to save as, as many people as you can but they have to conform and I think that that's that's probably the hardest thing in an acquisition is getting was, was it something you were uh, aware of before acquiring the company, something that you thought of, or is it usually something that you encounter after, after the move? I generally, if you look at, you know, when I say I speak from experience, it's not just our experiences. Bad sales culture has, generally speaking, led to a growth curve that looks like this and then like that. And we usually buy the company right at that with a blow-up stage of, you know, the sales force signed up terrible clients, terrible deals, underpriced everything, paid the salespeople lots of money, the company blew up in the process. Uh, a company has lots of clients, it blew up, you know, and that's a very typical thing that happens. Uh, you know, generally, I would say 80% of that has to do with a bad sales culture, and 20% is bad control, you know, that's related to the sales culture. There's nobody checking, nobody saying, you know, what the hell are we doing? I think that that's that's something you know that people uh, you know they always we, we want to be aggressive, especially as we get overhead. Right, we want to be more aggressive because we have to pay for that overhead, and that's generally how you know we cut corners. You know, we lose everything. I've seen that now dozens of times in the last fifteen years in this industry, and I think that that's you know I, I would say mostly because of bad sales. 
positive sales practices and they're probably going to be doing better than you are. So you look at the sales metrics, you look at the capabilities, the performance of the sales team and if they're doing better than yours, well, then you take some of that stuff on board. Of course you'd learn from them and so sometimes you can actually see um, the, the sales processes of the acquiring company can then get changed, not dramatically, not overnight because it's generally the larger company buying the smaller, but you can see a um, a trend towards best practice coming out of, uh, of an acquisition, which I think is quite good news and quite positive. So let's look on the bright side. And with that note, um, let's move to questions from the audience. We'll bring you a microphone. Just one second, please. Oh, yeah. Hello, Anastasia, Radio Forex. Uh, I have two and a half questions, if you don't mind. Uh, which CRM systems do you use for your sales department and uh, whether you're satisfied with that? Everybody, please. Well, in, in our case, uh, nearly everything is developing house. So the CRM that we are using is an in-house development done by us and adapted to the needs. And it's not that on a daily basis is updated, but in a yearly basis or an even a six month basis is constantly updated because what we do as well, it is uh, we get a team together, we invite them to um, open ideas, tell us what do you think, even if it's right or wrong, nobody's gonna judge you, what can we improve? Uh, so we modify and adapt our CRM to all our own needs. Yeah, we've seen, uh, well, on the companies we acquire, they, unfortunately, they all, both had different CRMs than we did. So if you've ever, ever integrated a company that had a lot of leads and uh, all information on a different CRM than yours, it was, you know, it was a, it was a big challenge. But uh, uh, so uh, we actually use uh, Microsoft Dynamics as our CRM. Uh, our, our, we have an uh, uh, office in, in London, which is... Uh, a sister company of Swissco Bank uh, called Swissco. Uh, uh, it's it's our UK uh, European headquarters, uh, and they use uh, Salesforce. We use uh, Salesforce. It's a highly customized version of Salesforce uh, with a lot of customizations and integration points into the different legacy systems. But the foundation is Salesforce. Yeah, I, we use Salesforce as well. But I've seen the, the the good and the bad of Salesforce where. Um, the previous company I worked for, the Salesforce was so complicated that a salesman used to have to go and get help pretty much every time they did a deal. And that was immensely tiresome and frustrating, whereas the iteration of Salesforce that we use now is much cleaner, much more efficient, and a little happier. Yeah, we use Salesforce, but just like Gain, you know, we, got, we build a lot of customizations to hook up to the systems, uh, it's hooked up to the back office, it can hooks up the marketing, so it has a lot of customization. It's definitely not something that you buy off the shelf, implement, and don't have to worry about. It's one of those things that you have to have a programmer on site, you know, you, you, you have to do a lot of work. It's an ever, you know, changing aggravation, you know, Salesforce. But it is, it's a good platform. Yeah, you are looking to this fight with the CRM. Well, we use sales as well, actually. Uh, Salesforce? Yeah, so, uh, well, we hired an, a Salesforce consultant, actually, uh, one year after we started, so we've done a lot of customization, but uh, I agree with my colleagues, you can't buy it off the shelf, then it's, it's actually a piece of crap. Uh, it needs really to be customized before it's, it's user-friendly. Thank you. Uh, you were talking a lot about, like, uh, it's your uh, your sales, their big family. You're trying to speak with them to have good relations. But how uh, you cope with the problem that forex have bad reputation for employees? Because eighty percent of people, when you ask, do you want to go to uh, work in my company, they say forex. Oh no, thanks, bye bye. How you cope with that? It's really big problem. I don't. I'm not sure about European brokers, but. In Russian broker, it's really a big problem. You gave them a way out with that last part. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd certainly like to start that one. As a 
full service brokerage that offers other products as well, we, we don't have that issue because a lot of our customers trade the indices and commodities and equities as well. So we're not solely focused on FX. But no, I don't think in London. Not customers. No, I mean, a, a lot of the, um, the salespeople have specialities in other areas as well. But I don't think FX has such a bad rep in London. I, I might be wrong, um, and maybe I, I've missed that. But I think that the reputation of the, um, the FX business in London is, is not too shabby, certainly in the institutional space. So you don't um, have there are, there are strong, <laughs> maybe not, no, I, I don't think that is too much of an issue in London. It, I, I, I think it I'm depends wrong. on the market, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're talking, you're recruiting, I think on the country, you're recruiting not staff. on the market. Yeah, well, in, 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 in CIS in particular, you're gonna have the same issue, right? But I, I think in the, in the Western markets, it's not so much, not so much a problem. But where there, in markets where there's been lots of abuse or, you know, it's very early on in the, in the, uh, in the process of people starting to be introduced into FX, FX, even in the U.S. and in, in, in Europe, initially in the early days had a terrible reputation as well. And so when you're trying to recruit people when that's what they know and think of the product, it's going to always be difficult. And until that changes in Russia, I don't think you're going to have uh, any better luck with uh, recruitment. Yeah, I think if you look at, think of why, the key reasons why people in places like Russia think it's bad. Right. One is I know the reason right, because to, some to brokers, you know, make a so-called education, uh, bring people and ask them to pay money for that, and everybody knows that. So it's that kind of stuff where you have to say we don't do this. I right. this is yeah the only thing I can say <laughs> when recruiting people, and very small question for uh, Dukas Coffee. Uh, you said about small projects for your sales. Uh, how long usually they do them? One project from start to finish? One month, two months? Well, depends on the size of the project, but normally it's around three to four months. Thank so you. they have like three, four a year. Thank you. I have no questions yet. Any more questions? Okay, so in conclusion, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, that uh, the managerial level faces when it comes to motivating a sales team nowadays? Let's start chronologically. Uh, I think still the, the biggest issue is, is retention. Uh, you know, you, you do burn out, I guess, in, in any sales role uh, over time. Uh, whether it's in, in FX sales or uh, you know futures or what do I have, so it, it's somehow that you can continue to uh, reignite them, give them new energy. You know, don't push them too hard all the time. You know, I think uh, it was said that of course they need to kick up the ass from time to time, but you know, a good mix of, of love and uh, money, kick up the ass. I think the, the toughest part is that uh, is okay, if you look at Generation Y and their disease is now spreading to other generations through like the iPhone and Facebook of like the instant gratification and constant need for approval and you know recognition and you know need to be babied a lot and this is now kind of spreading through the ages. I think there is the uh, especially I think in, in not so much in emerging markets, much more in Western countries. You have this much more uh, of an issue of people uh, being less entrepreneurial, more wanting to be nanny than taken care of. And I think this is something that, uh, you know, it's, it's been very tough on sales, right? And I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, especially in, in a retail business, that's been a thing. But it's, like I said, it's been, through the iPhone, I believe, is the disease that's infecting now the 40-year-olds also. And so it's getting... How through the iPhone, I must ask. It's the same, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it brings out the same personality, right? Because the iPhone just does everything quickly. So you want your boss to do everything quickly too, except that so if you say you have to work hard for two years, people have the iPhone, there's no concept of two years. You know, there's the flip to the left, flip to the right, can't find anything, then you yell at the iPhone, you know, like that. That, that's a that's a big thing like today people are more impatient right it's very hard for them it's why a lot of people move to commissions and money because they think that solves it right? they think okay that 
that's going to be the that that thing that does the instant gratification but instant gratification doesn't last right it's one of those things that goes away and it goes away again and i think that's the biggest challenge today is getting through getting people to commit you know in the longer term and i think uh what we are do is we're not afraid of churn right it's okay so you lose people if they're not committed let them go jim i think the the biggest challenge that the industry is going to see as a whole is finding decent quality people and hanging on to them. Finding decent quality salesmen that understand the markets, that know what they're talking about, is getting harder and harder and harder. But I do want to caveat that if you meet my colleagues downstairs, they're great, okay? So I'm not talking about them. But it is difficult to find um, the knowledgeable, competent, and motivated staff that you need. And all of the things that we've discussed have to be chucked into that melting pot to, to maintain that that motivation to attract the right people. And a lot of that's down to the manager, to the, um, uh, to the sort of charisma that the manager has, the energy that the manager has to keep that energy going, to keep that um, positivity going. Because as soon as things turn a bit grim and a bit negative, then that feeds across to the sales team and they'll get fed up and they'll leave. So you know, that's, that's the, the answer, you know, to keep positive, keep charismatic and chirpy. I think, um from an executive perspective, the, the biggest challenge is constantly assessing what you're doing and making sure it's right for the particular market that you're, you're trying to succeed in. Um, similar to Drew's point about the millennials or the Gen Ys, um, your sales, your retail sales strategy specifically has to be different depending upon who the target consumer is. You know, you, you don't nest today in many markets, you know, a proactive outbound phone based campaign is not going to work because they want to interact on the iPhone. They don't want to take a phone call. They won't take a phone call. But in some emerging markets, if you're trying to get at people in a reactive manner, you're not going to make any sales. So I think we have to challenge ourselves consistently on why we're doing what we're doing in the market. Is it working? And if we need to change tactics, I think that's the biggest challenge that we have as, a, as executives. I agree. Uh, communication is, a, is a, a big challenge as well, especially when you have large sales teams. Um, you know, making sure that each sales understands exactly what you're trying to communicate as a, as a manager. Because um, when, you, when you have global sales teams and they all get mixed messages, it causes uncertainty amongst the sales staff, which uh, you know, then more or less stops everything. So uh, you have to make sure, you know, you, when you're managing the sales team is to make sure that the message that you're trying to communicate is clear, uh, keep the door open for any questions. Uh, also, uh, making sure your, your team is constantly improving, evolving uh, ed through education of how, uh, how the, uh, the trading operations work or, or marketing works, uh, all these types of things. Uh, so, uh, you know, to make sure that all sales are more or less in line with each other on their knowledge uh, and uh, how the company operates. And in the, in the end, the customer will benefit from this, uh, from having a, a more knowledgeable salesperson that they communicate with. Well, um, from our point of view, my opinion is, like I said before, for us, one of the most difficult decisions to do is who to promote and when to promote him. Uh, that's for us something very crucial because he's the person who is going to lead the next generation and we have to make sure we actually pick the right person and everybody else on the team stays calm and accepts this. And another thing that we also face uh, is to have the time to know more our sales team. Where do we find the time to sit with each one of them and see what's going on if they have a kid, uh, what happened, your mother, your sister, everything is fine. Because we take a lot of time to know each one of our employees. I mean, it's not just a name when we have to pay the salaries. It's just the person behind it. So for us, it's also very difficult to have all this time in this especially moment to be able to say, OK, I have the time view, 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 and all, and all together. Thank you very much. I gotta say that I think that all of your uh, fascinating observations, first of all, uh, can relate not only to managing a sales team specifically, but managing a company, working with people. And I gotta say that each of these observations is worth a panel of its own. Um, so I at least uh, got some ideas for the next uh, events. I would like to thank all of you very much.